FRC Team 254 has been at the top of the competitive robotics scene for nearly a decade. Five-time world champions and holding the record for the most regional wins of any team, the infamy held by this organization is second to none. But how does this legendary team perform at the highest level year after year? Join Carnegie Mellon Robotics Academy in our exclusive two-part video series interviewing the Cheesy Poofs and asking the questions that everyone wants the answers to. Part 1. Engineering and Programming My name is Aryan Karthik. I'm the team president for Team 254. Hi, I'm Drew Goyle. I'm the team operations and competitions director. Hi, my name is Arnav Sawant. I'm a software lead on Team 254. And I'm Andrew Torrance. I'm an alumni of the team and now a mentor, mostly doing mechanical design and team leadership. Cool. All right, so let's start off with our engineering questions. So first of all, what's your design process? Like, how do you go from the game to the ideas and then selecting and actually constructing them? Sure, um, I think I can take this one. Um, essentially, the first day of build season on the game reveal day, we'll have a really long build. So on this day, the entire team will gather in the lab, uh, We'll watch the reveal live stream together. And um, after that, students will read through the rule book that they release and we'll take like a small quiz on it just, just so everyone knows the rules and we all understand the, dis the constraints which we need to design within. And uh, after com people have completed this quiz, we can we decide very generally what we want our robot to do task wise. So we make it a rule during this process, never to mention like specific mechanical um, mechanisms or anything like that. We just decide what tasks we want our robot to do. So for example, this year, um, we said we wanted our robot to have a traversal climb. We wanted our robot to be able to score in the upper hub. We wanted our robot to be able to intake balls off of the ground, like things like that. So it's very a uh, general breakdown of the tasks. And then once we uh, decide which tasks we want to do and not do, uh, we kind of start proposing mechanisms and ideas to do that. So for example, um, infinite recharge. 2020 season, we kind of knew from the beginning that for our shooter, we wanted to mount our shooter on a turret so we could score from different parts of the field. So once we kind of understand uh, that, we split the robot into different subsystems like the shooter, the intake, serializer, et cetera. And then different experienced design students will kind of take the lead and volunteer to lead different uh, subsystem projects. And then there'll be a small team kind of dedicated to each subsystem. And then that's kind of when the prototyping process begins. We figure out which ideas we have seem the most feasible and effective. And uh, yeah, that's when we start prototyping. And so that actually perfectly leads into our next question, which is how do you prototype as far as like materials and techniques and stuff like that? Okay. Um, first of all, we always try to draw inspiration from like previous year's robots. Uh, often there can be uh, a relevant connection or similarities between different years. Um, for example, our shooter in 2020 and our shooter in 2022 we're very similar because they're mounted on a turret, an adjustable hood shooter. It's the same system. It's a turret, and we use a Vigus energy chain to get all the wires um, to the shooter. So yeah, it was we, we drew a lot of inspiration from previous years. But um, when we're prototyping something completely new, uh, we'll start off with like really bare basic prototypes. Um, always start off with like wood, wood screws. Uh, we use drills to simulate the rotary motion of motors and. Sometimes we'll attach some pneumatic pistons uh, and connect them to our machine shop compressed air to simulate the linear motion. And uh, if these prototypes show some potential, um, we also can start expanding on these prototypes. But um, during this wood phase, we do a lot of parameter testing. So like we'll add a bunch of mounting holes to each um, you know, wooden piece and kind of experiment with different like dimensions, different levels of compression. So for example, this year with our intake, we kind of got it had this wood uh, beam and our rollers were mounted at different heights and we wanted to test how much compression we want on the cargo. And um, after testing and recording the results, we kind of decided that about 1.5 inches of compression was optimal. So um, through these prototypes, we will see which ones have potential. And then we kind of can assemble wire uh, manufacture prototypes made out of wood that we mount on the robot itself onto a drive base. But um, this year, because we were very familiar with a lot of the subsystems, like an over the bumper intake, we've done that a lot before. This year, we kind of went straight into polycarbon metal um, iterations. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah. So it sounds like you guys do a lot of uh, laser cutting for your prototyping. Yeah, definitely. definitely. Yeah, we also have a 
like a cartoon CAD that we kind of finish at the end of week one with like all the subsystems. So we try to figure out how everything will pack into one robot. So mm -hmm. it's not like a detailed CAD at all, but um, you kind of have the general shape, general size of each subsystem, try to pack it onto one robot, figure out how, how everything will work. So yeah. that sounds really intuitive. Sounds like it would work well. Okay, so what's the general goal and time you have for getting your CAD done every year? Like, what do you, what week do you want to have your CAD done by? Okay, um, we get this question a lot, and we we don't really have an answer to this question because our iteration process and our CAD process basically never ends. We're always mm -hmm. finding new ways to optimize, figuring out what ways we can improve our robot, and the CAD will constantly change. Even after regionals, between different competitions, we're always iterating, like. I think in 2019, we had this climber that worked well, but then between our, our last regional and world, we completely changed the climber to a suction climber. So like we will always be iterating, we will always be making changes. So our finalized, cat, like if you want specific weeks, we try to have a drive train done by like week two and maybe have all the subsystems on a robot by week four, but like these are obviously not the final. Um, mm -hmm iterations so you guys definitely design with like intent to iterate yes i mean we're very fortunate to be able to have a lot of like machines and manufacturing machines as like the cnc mill cnc router and everything so we're able to iterate extremely fast and we're constantly pumping out new plates pumping pumping out new iterations creating new prototypes mm -hmm. things like that but we do know that our first iteration will probably not work as well as we want it to and we will keep on going until either we are happy with how our subsystem performs or until competition is in a week and we have to yeah. finalize something so i guess one thing that makes it interesting is even though you have access to all those tools when you're at a competition you don't so how do you deal with like mechanical damages that happen at in like the fast-paced atmosphere of a competition right um First of all, we always try to design a robot to be really robust because we know that FRC defense can get pretty aggressive. So, um, for example, like our intakes, we always make them out of polycarb plates because uh, it absorbs impact much better by flexing and bending rather than potentially like snapping like a metal plate would. So we always make sure that we incorporate um, kind of wire management and other things like that to make sure that our robot is robust and will not kind of no failures will occur just from some impact and things like that. But we always do prepare for the worst. So um, we make a bunch of spares and we try to anticipate which parts of the robot are most likely to break. And we kind of just manufacture a bunch of spares and organize them by kit or like by subsystems. Mm -hmm. We have a kit for each subsystem, like intake, shooter, et cetera. And um, we just manufacture a bunch of spares, especially 3D printed parts. We have a bunch of spares for those. And um, yeah, we also design our robot to be pretty modular so we can kind of take it apart pretty fast. That's really helpful. Yeah. I think we can take our entire superstructure off of our robot by like unscrewing about 10 screws and disconnecting a bunch of like wire pigtails and things like that. So we always factor it into our design process and then manufacture and keep a bunch of spares in our pit as well. And the next two questions are programming related. So what do programmers do during the season before having a constructed robot to work with? And then yeah, how about so, during the off season as well? Yeah, yeah. So early in the season, before we have a robot, we typically rely on past robots um, that we've either built during the past off season or during previous seasons as well. So like, I'll give you the best example right now is, so if you followed our team for a long time, you know that we've always specialized in like the West Coast Drive. Um, we've always tried doing a sword prototypes over the last few years um, to, it, for the chance that we could implement it during a build season. So this year was actually the first year we did a swerve drive during um, our build season. And what we uh, we built a swerve prototype actually last off season, and we actually got a good portion of our software done on that swerve prototype. So heading into the build season, we could really accelerate our progress and try to iron out some of the kinks of a swerve drive with like odometry and with path following. And we could do this in parallel because of our swerve prototype. Um, we could do it in parallel with our design assembly and manufacturing team as they brought up our production and our, our comp and practice spots. So we that's one thing is we always can have the ability to use past robots um, to test features. Another robot, another cool thing we always have is we always have a robot we like to call a dev board. It basically is a robot which contains all of the electrical components you typically find on a first robot, like a radio, battery, 
um, CAN wiring, PDP, et cetera. So the only thing it lacks is like any true mechanisms. And we typically use this dev board for rapid um, sensor testing. So I'll give you an example in this past last season, on the early part of the season, um, before mounting our Limelight Vision camera onto our comp and practice bot, we actually mounted it on our dev board. And this allowed us to actually work on our vision processing code in parallel with, uh, like in, again, in parallel with the bring up of our comp and practice bot. So that's that additionally helped us. Uh, we also have a picture of us testing out the new CTRE candle on this dev board. So I think, yeah, we've always relied on past robots, uh, especially early on in the season and during the off season. Um, another major part of our off season is obviously skills development for newer members. So with these, uh, with newer members, we always try to give them practice projects in order to prepare them for the build season. And these practice projects also come from having them implement um, concepts in code or um, other like like other logic from past robots. And the way we do these practice projects, we will assign it to them, and we typically have them do the project, write the code. And typically, experienced software members can then review them and uh, review the code and give them feedback. Yeah, I think that's definitely def uh, very important to keep track of uh, training new software team members. That kind of leads into our next thing. How do you organize an efficient programming team so that not everyone's working at the same thing at the same time? And I guess also, how do you log your changes? Yeah. So uh, at the beginning of our of any before we write any code, the first thing we do is we write down all of our projects in a spreadsheet and we assign project leads. So we find organization is extremely important, um, especially for like keeping track of deadlines um, and like getting things done on time. So that's the first thing we do is we always start off being organized, assigning project leads um, in an easy, visible place. Additionally, one thing we do do is we also start off with a priority, um, like a priority order of projects. Uh, and the reason we do this is as we approach deadlines, we can determine which projects require more attention um, than others. Um, so then, yeah, after laying out all our like pro our projects in place and assigning project leads, uh, we then like when talking from a programming standpoint, what we use is uh, as is common in the computer science industry, we utilize Git. Um, Git is a software that basically allows you um, to collaborate with other uh, with other team members, and it automatically logs your changes. Um, and one thing we do emphasize a lot on Team Two Fifty Four is something we call um, good Git flow. Uh, essentially, what this means is, if you're familiar with Git, you can create various branches of your code. So we treat our master branch as sacred, and in the sense that, well, we don't want we on that branch. We need tested code that works for sure that is not buggy at all. So we ensure like we don't push any untested code on that branch. And whenever we want to add a new feature, we'll create a new feature branch. We'll debug all the kinks of that branch uh, of, of that feature on that branch before creating a pull request. Uh, and merging back into the master branch. And the reason we create pull requests rather than typically just merging directly is because pull requests allow other experienced members as well as mentors to have a look at your code uh, and make sure it's not buggy in any way before pushing it back into the master branch. So the reason we aim to be as meticulous and thorough as possible when it comes to making major changes to robot software is that even during builds when the software team is not present, like during driver practice, that bills can operate smoothly because the last thing we want is to waste time, uh, waste the driver's time by having buggy, untested code uh, for them to have to like debug or scramble um, during their practice. So we aim to make uh, their time as efficient as possible by being as meticulous as possible. Yeah, I feel like definitely everyone struggled with a random code bug and then having the whole struggle, whether programming or mechanical. Yeah. So I guess it's very important to uh, make sure you're meticulous. Okay, yeah. so the rest of our, our robots questions are getting. Our robots are getting more and more complicated every year. So yeah. more degrees of freedom. Now we've got the swerve drive too. It's getting really, really hard to uh, write code that has zero bugs on the first pass. So yeah. it's very important. Definitely. Okay. So and that concludes part one of our interview with the Cheesy Poofs. Be on the lookout for the next segment in which we will be discussing some big scale questions along with a couple fun ones.